Welcome to Blake Street Banter, where one of us knows what the word banter means. The other two are just along for the ride. James, say hi. What's up? And Julian, say what's up. What's up, everybody? This is Julian, uh, Fresno Grizzlies ticket office uh, dude, just doing his thing, hanging out with us today. And uh, we're just we're just trying to make our rounds around Fresno. Um, everybody's been just super nice and willing to hang out with us and talk ball. And so let's do it. How how did you, the listeners, want to know this? How did you get into the ticket office game? Uh, so it's actually kind of an interesting story. Uh, my degree is in culinary arts and hospitality management. Uh, so at the time in 2019, I was working for a restaurant out here in town. Uh, decided to kind of switch up my career path and uh, went to a job fair at the stadium and met the current boss, Eric Moreno, and another one of the bosses at the time. And uh, went through the process of interviewing, got hired on as a game day staff member, and you know, just really took advantage of being able to have a job, doing something that I like, being around the game of baseball. And uh, just through everything that's happened with COVID and the shortening of staff and all that, I've been fortunate enough to be uh, one of the few people brought back. And here I am now, you know, just reaping the benefits of, of a great job, being around a really good ball club, uh, working with some really good individuals uh, from top to bottom in the, in the organization. I like that. So are you, are you cooking up stuff for the office at all? You ever do stuff at home <laughs> and bringing it in? Of course. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm always down to like cook it up for the boys and all that. And uh, you know, we definitely have potlucks within the office. We try to make sure everybody has some good food. So me, myself, and a couple of the other ladies that work uh, throughout the game day staff, they like to make stuff for, for everyone. And uh, yeah, that's, it's really cool. We got a good little, what's, uh, what's the Julian special. I was just going to ask that. Oh man. Uh, you know, it's hard to pass up a good lasagna. It's kind of easy to put together. It's not, you know, doesn't take as much work, maybe so much prep, but uh, not so much to serve it, to have it ready and all that. But uh, one of our big specialties, we have this uh, lovely lady, her name's Patty. She works our will call booth on game days and she makes up some mean desserts, man. I'll tell you what, I can eat about four <laughs> or five pieces of cake. And it's, you know, that's my dinner sometimes because it's just too much, too much good stuff to pass up. So uh, it's definitely a lot of good options in there. Walk me, walk me through the, uh, the day to day of the, the ticket office. Like, um, what's that like? What's, what's kind of the craziest stories that uh, you have to tell? All right. So, I mean, first thing, like when I come in, I basically go through my emails for the day, whatever I need to do. And then, you know, we, we open up our windows and we get a good little walk up crowd coming throughout the day. We got all kinds of interesting characters walking by the windows, all kinds of cool people that want to talk to us about, about the team, talk to us about the games, talk about experiences and stuff like that. So uh, that kind of is my pregame stuff. And then throughout the course of the game, I'm out there talking to fans. I'm out there trying to make sure people that are there for group outings are taken care of, things like that. So. What's the most ridiculous thing you've heard, like, in the ticket office? Because uh, we talked to Stephen probably a month or two yeah. ago, and he received a phone call from an angry lady about the weather. And we all know that Stephen yeah. Rice Cakes uh, <laughs> yeah. Rice is in charge of the weather. And yeah, that's his job. So what's the most ridiculous, absolutely most ridiculous thing you've heard? Oh, man, you know, poor Stephen, man, that guy. <laughs> He's literally like a magnet for these bad phone calls. I tell you what, the kid, he'll show up uh, in the morning, do his game notes, and he's just stressing out because the poor kid, he works so hard, and he's got a lot on his plate just for him individually. But shout out to him for not only connecting me with you guys, but also for doing what he does every day as well. But, he yeah, he'll come in. Though. Yeah, I mean, he's, you know, he's doing a lot on his own uh, for what he has to do. So he's obviously stressed because of it, and we'll get in there and do his thing and, he'll answer the phone and everybody that just seems to talk to him just has more of a, of a uh, concern than they do a positive comment or something like that. So he has to deal with that more often than not. But <laughs> one of my, one of my favorite ones, Steven literally said he picked up the phone and uh, within two seconds, the guy had basically just cussed him out like all kinds of crazy. Right. So I was like, Oh, okay. Transfer it over to me. And like, I started talking to the guy, calmed him down a little bit. And he was like, yeah, whoever that was that answered the phone, just tell them next time not to answer the phone with such a tone. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was just like, man, poor Steven, he's over there just answering in his own good mood and still getting shit for it. So 
How was, about one of the better? How about one of the better stories of customer service? You got somebody that's just extra grateful or anything like that? Oh, all the time. So I mean, uh, one of my favorite stories for me personally this year, um, we had a lady from Visalia Rawhide reach out to us, uh, particularly me, about getting tickets to come out with some of her family. Uh, she had a little bit of an incident coming up, like a personal matter, and uh, she wasn't able to attend. But then when I reached out to her, she came up to me and made made me feel, you know, really special about how, like, I went the extra mile to make sure everything was okay with her and, you know, didn't really so much worry about the game ticket stuff, just kind of, like, talking to her about, you know, hey, is everything okay? How's your family members? Are you guys getting through everything okay? Stuff like that. So, uh, you know, and then another season ticket holder, I talked to on the phone. I hadn't actually met him in person more than maybe once or twice, uh, but uh, I talked to him on the phone, helped him get set up with some tickets for that night. And he actually brought my my six-year-old daughter a, a teddy bear that was like from 1954 and was like, oh, this is for your daughter for graduating kindergarten. And I was like, wow, that's, that's crazy. You know, like, I mean, like I said, I have barely started in the front office this year and obviously learning all the season ticket holders via email is not as easy as doing it uh, person to person over the course of a full off season as well. Like I started in, I want to say April, you know, and we barely just from there got going and that was it. So a lot of the people I met were just off of emails or phone calls. It wasn't no face to face contact at the time and stuff like that. So it's been a, a learning process, but it's been a lot of fun, a lot, a lot more positive stories, a lot more, you know, good stories. Uh, than, than the bad ones for sure. But it's always fun to look back and kind of laugh at the growing moments like that. So uh, we, we we definitely have fun with it and we definitely, you know, try to roll with the punches, if you will. So, Yeah. As much crap that is going on in this world, there are still majority decent human beings out there. Oh, cool. Everybody's just, they do have good vibes, good hearts for the most part. So that's good to hear. Yeah, of course, man. I think the bottom line uh, that you'll see, especially amongst our fans, is everybody's just be happy to be out again, experiencing the game in person. Um, you know, it's not exactly so much been a difference with the fact that we're single A now or anything like that. I think people that have come out and been around the team, they realize that we're putting out a good product. Uh, and it's, you know, definitely resulting in wins and losses, but also just the overall game experience, even when we do lose games at home. I think the crowd's always in for a pretty good treat. Uh, they get a good experience from the players that are out there. And, yeah, so. So are you guys back to full capacity yet? or? Yeah, we, we, we are at full capacity. We actually uh, went back officially on the 15th of June, and uh, we really touted that 4th of July weekend as our reopening weekend. So that was where a lot of our eggs were uh, in our basket, if you will. And, uh, yeah, it was a really great turnout. We had – crowds of eight nine and ten thousand over the course of the weekend uh the the crowd on saturday got treated to a grant levine walk-off uh, which was absolutely electric if you guys want i can send you a little a video i got of it uh i was standing behind that. the right i was standing behind the right field wall and uh me and one of the ops guys and i was just like you know i've been watching his batting practice i know what this kid's been doing out there you know during my lunch break i'll go sit out there and watch batting practice for about my last 20 minutes or so and uh I seen his swing and I was like, he's going to do something right now. We are, we've been slowly coming back in the game and it was just like, all right, one piece to another is like, all right, it's going to be a home run. So who's going to hit it? Is it going to be Zach? Unfortunately it wasn't him, but I was like, Grant's probably the next best choice and got it on video. So yeah, I'll send it over. It was wild. Yeah. We'll put that <laughs> in right now. <laughs> Come on, Grant. Let's go, baby. Come on, Grant. mentioned just the fans being part of the you know the, the the stadium the team and your um just the overall experience was what's like the giveaway that you dig like what's the one that like gets the most people in it is it the is it the princess and pirates that make people show up is it that replica jersey that is sweet and if there's any extra in the back if you want to send it this way we'll take it um, i got you guys i got you guys <laughs> i would love one of those replica yeah jerseys. those things on Saturday yeah, I, sick. yeah, the, yeah the, those were real nice actually for a replica jersey they were definitely they're button-ups they're 
really good material. Uh, they look good. Nice and lightweight. So, yeah, I think I definitely could hook you guys up with a couple of them. So we'll talk off air. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> but, like, what is it that, like, what's, what, what's one of those promos, those giveaway nights that, like, bring the people in? You know, honestly, for us out here, I think the consensus has been, like, those ring giveaways when we do World Series replicas. Uh, so uh, oh, those, yeah. three, those three years that the Grizzlies were affiliated with the Giants, uh, they did a couple of them. Uh, they also did. They also did one for the Astros as well. Uh, so those, I mean, have been primarily pretty good turnouts just because of the fact that it's a replica ring. I think people really like those. Uh, but for this season, it definitely has been that jersey giveaway. That was uh, one of the top hitters. Uh, we also did a Jose Ramirez bobblehead. And uh, if you're not aware who that man is, he's a boxer from out here in Fresno. Yeah. Uh, so we basically did a promotion with him where before his title fight, we had a bobblehead giveaway of him. Um, so yeah and then character giveaways are always nice as far as like having them in the park like princess and pirates will generate that crowd as far as the younger children and all that gets the parents to actually show up because their kids want to be there uh, we have peppa pig night coming up um, so things like that those are always uh, real nice as far as reaching out to a little bit different of a crowd uh, of people who may or may not show up on given nights so yeah for sure I noticed that you mentioned the Rockies don't have a ring um, in that giveaway there. Do you well, want to go out there like Johnny Bravo did and guarantee a World Series in the next five years? You know, if that Fresno magic is what we have, you know, brewing <laughs> out here, we're trying our best to make it work. It's going to be tough, you know, so there's a lot of competition in those top three spots uh, right now for the, for the West. So uh, if, it, if it happens, we definitely know where it came from. And we definitely know where to attribute it all to. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want to put too much pressure on, on the younger cats to uh, get there and then have it all fall on their shoulders. So if it happens, we definitely know where it came from, though. <laughs> well, uh, to be fair, I think we're about to ship off a bunch of, <laughs> bunch of key pieces and Watch we're get some prospects in the process. Yeah. So I think, I think a bunch might land there in Fresno. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very likely. I mean... Uh, I don't know what you guys feel about the uh, the upper guys with the story and all that right now, if he is gone or all that, but I definitely see the Rockies as being like a very bottom to top organization right now, as far as like what I'm seeing them do with their, they've got a lot of talent down there with us. And I know Spokane got a few of our guys that we started out with and they've already had some guys. So I can only imagine if two to three years of full pro ball and development, what it could do for them. And, you know, Things change over time, you know. Anything could happen in a given season. Like, look who's we leading the NL West right now. It's not a team that everybody expected in, uh, you know, February. So, yeah, for I sure. I think that the uh, I think the Rockies are about to ship off so much talent. They're going to call up Julian from the ticket office. <laughs> hey, you hey, know, we need an analytics department. Hey, man, you know, I got uh, my swings on my page. You can find it if you guys are scouting <laughs> for me. Let me know. No. <laughs> Let's so go. you uh you mentioned that the Grizzlies are associated with the Giants and they have a winning pedigree, blah, 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 Giants, blah, blah, blah. Is that what made you a Giants fan? Um, you mentioned you're a San Francisco Giant fans, so nobody holding against him. He uh is that where your roots started? Was being in no. Fresno, being associated with San Francisco? Uh no, so actually I grew up in the Bay Area. Uh, okay. So Hayward, Hayward, California, uh, it's about maybe like 25 minutes away from San Francisco uh, if on when there's no traffic, obviously. But uh, <laughs> so I grew up out there, watched Barry Bonds growing up. Can't lie. That was a lot of what I had to do with uh, just being infatuated with the long ball and trying to replicate that as a left handed hitter. And uh, I mean, you know, I went to A's games a lot, too. Uh, that was definitely part of uh, the whole thing for me. But I just it kind of felt more along the lines of being a Giants fan. Like I said, just kind of like Barry Bonds' game. Um, really wish I could see him get inducted into the Hall of Fame, but that's a whole nother discussion <laughs> that, you know, we could, we could have a, at a different time. But, you know, uh, no, for me, for me, though, the Giants, they've been um, my team. And then coming to Fresno, I, then I kind of realized, oh, that's the tie with the, with the Giants was here. And uh, I didn't really put those together. But now that I've been with the team and, you, uh, you have a lot of season ticket holders that have been here since the very beginning. Even before the Grizzlies had Chick Chansey Park, they played at Fresno State's uh, baseball stadium. Mm -hmm. And so we have season ticket holders that have been with us since then. Uh, so for them, those are the people that definitely, like, bring up those kind of times and are uh, 
definitely like been fans of the club for, because of that reason as well. And also been just around because, you know, Fresno is a really, a really good baseball town too. Uh, we have a lot of talent at the youth level. There's a lot of, a lot of organizations and clubs for the kids to participate in out here. A lot of good travel teams. Uh, it's a little bit of a warmer uh, area. So sometimes it doesn't get the, uh, the tournaments like held here as much as we would like, but definitely has a lot of good prospects going out in different places as well. So. Yeah. The, yeah, the ball there, it has to be fun, even though it's like 115 degrees all the time. Yeah. Uh, my, myself, I play Sunday league. We played yesterday. It was like one Oh five uh, at one o'clock when we were playing. And I mean, I did that for one day. I can't imagine the guys out there. They've been playing basically four or five days straight, even six days straight in that heat. So uh, shout out to them for being able to put through that and still put on a good performance even uh, through all that too. So. Yeah. We, uh, we talked to Sam Weatherly a few weeks ago. He, he was talking to us outside under an umbrella, had it propped up on the umbrella stand, literally 15 minutes into the interview, the conversation, his phone overheated and he had to take that inside. It was like yeah, 10 o'clock in the morning and he was like, yeah, phone's not doing it. That's crazy. Yeah. It, it gets a little warm. So the thing is, you'll see a lot of guys go get their runs in early in the morning before like eight o'clock, you know? And so it's, it's just part of uh, adapting to the weather. But I think for these guys, the thing that they have going for them is they'll end up somewhere a little bit more hospitable where it's like Spokane is nicer weather and then Hartford's nice and Albuquerque maybe not so much uh, better or worse as far as the heat goes and all that. But uh, just at that point, you're so close to the show. You're not really worried about what the weather's like outside, I'm sure. Yeah, you're not worried about that at all. So Giants fan, let's go back to this. Uh, how, why are they at the top? I'm not, I'm going to be honest with you. The Giants are like my second least favorite NL West team. I think we both agree that we don't like the Dodgers. All of us agree on that, but it's hard. It's hard to like the color blue is just not something that I can do. No, nobody me. looks good in it either. Like, I don't know yeah. how, um, but how are the Giants good? Like they don't have names to say, like, what are they doing? How are they doing it? And do they hold on? So we'll go a little bit reverse order. Do they hold on? I believe so. I don't think it, it's they hold on by a lot. I think it does come down to the last series or maybe the last two series. Um, they obviously won't play the Dodgers very much down the stretch. So that kind of does help. They're going to have the series coming up here in San Francisco. And then after that, they don't have very much back and forth uh, going to L.A., I actually don't think they play in L.A. at all the rest of the season, which is good. And then finishing off the Padres uh, in that last stretch, they got like seven games against them. So if they're able to, you know, go four out of three, that doesn't really hurt them in the standings. Um, but, you know, how they're doing it, it's basically just everybody being willing to buy into what Kapler and Farhan set out for them I think uh if you look at it you, they're you're right they're not doing it with names but they're doing it with guys that are just filling into roles Lamont Wade Jr. hit two home runs yesterday uh here's a guy that got no shot in Minnesota but is getting all the chance now to shine because of injuries and such but doing it because of the progression that they've held for him uh, through AAA and such mm -hmm. uh, then you've also got pitching that's been timely uh, the bullpen has been a little bit shaky in spots, but at the same time, I feel really comfortable uh, with most of the guys they throw out there. I think when, when you have Tyler Rogers in a situation against guys who haven't faced him very much, he's very hard to pick up, and that's favorable. McGee will be a guy that will just try to powerball uh, his way through his three outs, and in certain situations, that might work, you know, but um, for the most part, I'm pretty much just feeling like it's really just coming down to the Giants being uh, adaptive to what they're being told to do. You know, like guys are just willing to go out of their way to pick up the next guy. You go up and down the lineup, everybody feels comfortable, even if they get it out, that the next person will step up for them. So I think the most frustrating thing as a Rockies fan is that McGee's actually good now. Yeah. We, we had him for three years. And yeah. It was yeah, like and uh, hit or miss. Yeah, you know, that I don't know if that's so much an organizational thing or a setting thing. Um, you know, like the guy didn't he's he's been spotty to me at points where like, okay, like it's the ninth inning, we have a two-run lead. 
but you give up two runners and then you put yourself in high, high pressure situations when you've had all the leverage. Mm-hmm. And now you gotta, you gotta go out there and get three tougher outs. And granted you're able to do that in more situations than not, but it's still not what you want to be as an ideal closer. You want to go up there, you want to get your three outs and be on with your day. Kind of like a Liam Hendricks, um, yeah. you know, so. You're preaching to the choir with that McGee adding pressure to it i mean I, the, I think it's i think it's a level of forgiveness in course field yeah. you have no level of forgiveness yeah 100 percent. yeah yeah in san francisco yeah. you have a at least a little bit yeah 100 percent. yeah because i do i do want to say he blew a save in colorado this Good. year right <laughs> yeah i heard I, that I, brother i've yeah, seen so that a million times i i mean he, he's no, used to just, that that was just old habits uh, coming out. As Crook and Kipe say, ownage is ownage. And if a stadium has ownage on you, it will ever forever hold you. So um, I think yeah. that it's it's one of those things, like you said, that that stadium will not be nice to you if you're if you're a, a fly ball pitcher, you're definitely not gonna be in for a fun night. So he allowed four runs that night. I'm looking it up right now. San Francisco at Colorado, they got the L. He allowed four earned runs and point two innings. Yeah. And it one of the or it was a couple of home runs or one home run. Uh, where'd it go? There it is. I want, oh, I want zero to say it was, it was zero oh, home no? runs that night. Oh, okay. This was back in beginning of May when he had it. It made his ERA go from two ninety two to five fifty four in that one outing. Nice. And then he's been working yeah. his ass off to bring it back down to two forty five. Man. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, overall, it's been better than it has uh, looking like from the beginning with him. So that's something that as a Giants fan, you like to be uh, optimistic. But as a Rockies fan, you like to be pessimistic on it because you're like this guy. We know what he's made of. We know what he's done. He's capable of doing. So I I do hope that he's able to close it down the stretch for us. And uh, like I said, I I just think that the fact that guys are just stepping up from all these different places, like mm-hmm. who, who was Darren Ruff? No one really knew that. And, you know, uh, this guy is coming in and hitting off off the bench and coming in and playing first base and playing left field and doing all kinds of random things that someone like him usually wouldn't get a shot to do. Uh, and so it's it's a different sort of game, man. I feel I feel like Farhan and them are just playing a little bit. Uh, more to the modernist type of game and it's just working out a little bit better for them right now Um, but anything can happen in October so uh, the Giants weren't the Giants weren't favored coming into any postseason they may be favored if they keep up right now what they're doing so that might not be something that's favorable uh, for them they had to kind of play the the underdog role and they did it really well obviously but yeah and their starting pitching has been pretty solid like no way Kevin Gossman was expected to do this or Alex Wood. They're getting yeah. nice rebound years from those guys. I'm looking at this yeah. roster. I can say I don't know any of these like starters now because you have you have Listella on the DL, you have Longoria on the DL, you have Brandon Belt, I'm sorry, on the IL. Yep. And like you're still winning. This yep. is dumb. This is yeah, Crawford bad. Crawford's supposed to be coming back here uh sometime um early August. I know Belt was running, and they said his knee was doing better, but they weren't sure about him. That's kind of something I heard on the radio this morning. Uh, but Longoria is the the real wild card right now because when he comes back, then that really affects like five to six different people. That affects Wilmer Flores, Darren Ruff, Lamont Wade. It even affects Brandon Belt a little bit. Right. Um, so there's just there's just a big kind of you know uh, six degrees of separation from that that you get. Uh, so it's like tough because these guys are doing so well you don't really want to take anyone out and at the same time you don't want to deny Longo his at bats that's a big that's a big piece of money right there just sitting on the shelf so yeah and James is a big Longo fan as is so he he I know he's happy to see Longo Longoria come back huh James yeah yeah I was uh doing a comparison between Longo and Tulo's career and uh Longo's doing pretty good <laughs> yeah i mean he had he hasn't been able to get the, the the ring quite yet but like as a numbers and as far as like he was pretty hyped up when he was playing in durham and then he came up and he's been pretty steady for a long number of years so uh for him to go from just a phenom to continuously being up there and then you know his 
his bat fell off a little bit, but that's going to happen when you get through some of the injuries he's been dealing with in this age and day, you know, so. Yeah. Well, he's been doing fantastic this year. I mean, yeah. And <clears throat> the frustrating part is that the Rockies actually had a chance to take him and they passed on him. And I can't remember who they took, but I don't think it turned out very well. Michael. Michael. Yeah. What's that? Mike's on it. Yeah. Get Mike on it. Let us yeah. Know. So maybe. But yeah, so I mean, it's it's interesting because you know, like one thing I've noticed about the game nowadays is uh, I feel like you'll see guys try to take second base a lot more on a, on what should be a routine single. Like for example, on Saturday, uh, Zach Veen hit a really hard, like what I assume to be just a single to the right kind of uh, left side of the center fielder, excuse me, and uh, he legged it out for a double, and it was just pure speed out of the box, and like those are the things that. Some of these scouts are evaluating and they're, they're looking for for guys and they want spark plugs. They want guys who are going to steal extra bases and uh, get that free 90 out of something that doesn't usually get found. So uh, that's that's something that I see from the Grizzlies as far as like I can see that the Rockies probably asking things like that out of those guys, you know, uh, to work yeah. on getting that extra 90 and trying to steal free bases when you can. If the defense is lapsing, take advantage of it. So. Yeah, they, it's really uh, funny you bring that up because just last Thursday I was playing slow pitch softball, and this guy who's got a got a hunched over swing and glasses on, he, he laces one into right field and took two on us. Caught us by oh, surprise. Man. See, there it is. You got to just watch. <laughs> you got to be aware of everyone. You know, so. must been must have been watching the Grizz. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The Grizzlies aren't aren't they leading the uh, league in stolen bases? Uh, yeah, they are. They are up there. I know they're. Uh, definitely top in the low A West. I know that in all of minor league baseball, I want to say Steven had told me most recently they were like top five. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, they, bases. they hustle, man. I, I Something I noticed from the very get uh, on opening day was this team will definitely play the hustle game. Um, they, they work really hard. Uh, and their reps and all that. When I see them out there doing their stuff with the coach and staff, they're really focused in. Uh, they're working hard on everything they're trying to get better at as a team. And then when they're playing the game, they're legging out uh, balls to the shortstop. They're not, uh, uh, you know, hobbling over and just kind of getting a free out. They're trying to get there. Uh, they do all the things that you would expect out of a young professional player. So right. uh, that's one thing that I, I feel like the organization is trying to get out of them for the next step. A lot of these guys won't be here with us next year. And uh, the thing is to make sure that when they do move on, that they're just, you know, even more seasoned and ready to roll. So. Right, right. Let's, I mean, let's hope, let's hope that's what it is and there's stuff happening. Um, yeah. Let's, so you're part of the Rockies organization now, even though you're a Giants fan, whatever. Um, oh, Mike got back to me. Sorry. Mike got back. We drafted Greg Reynolds before we did Evan Longoria. Um, you might have heard of Greg Reynolds. Probably not. No, no, never. <laughs> yeah, that's I say I that. Yeah. had a chance though. Yeah, we had it. Uh, yeah. But one thing we did with Steven and Johnny Bravo, I don't know if you listened to the pods or not, we asked them some Rockies trivia. Yeah, yeah. So I, I am aware that I'm going to have to uh, show my baseball savvy here. And so I've, I've definitely tried my best to come prepared. Uh, I've, read through, <laughs> I've read through the encyclopedias and all such uh, reading materials. So my spark notes hopefully are good. Okay. So James, you need to get Mike on it to find another question because I feel like Julian's prepared. Um, so the one few questions we asked was when, when is the Rockies inaugural year? Okay. That was, uh, 1992. <laughs> no. oh, 1993. You're really, no, you're way so closer close. than the other two. The other oh, two were like two thousands. Was... Um, the Rockies, being in Coors, high altitude, had some Blake Street bombers. Can you name four slash five of those bombers in the nineteen nineties? Uh, would Dante Bichette be one? He is one. Yes. Um, is Larry Walker one? Yeah. Yes. Uh. Todd Helton? No, that's not a night. Not a nineties. Uh, that's a two thousands. Different era. I like the name drop though. Okay. Okay. Oh man, starting to run thin here on on the names. Can't really. One of them coached the uh, futures game. 
Celebrity All Star Game? No, I think it's the Futures Game. He helped the NL side. Oh, oh man, it's slipping me right now. It really is. You're about You're to make Mexican me. Google. Player? I'm about to go. Yeah. Oh no. Nope. Third base. <laughs> Third Vinny, baseman. Vinny Castilla. Oh, okay, okay. And then uh, Andres Big Cat Galarraga. Oh my God, Big Cat! He played for the Giants. How could I forget the Big Cat? I was I was a little disappointed. The, that, that honestly, that's that should be the like strike three for all all of them right there. <laughs> big, big Cat hit the home runs the furthest. So yeah, he was. I remember watching him as a kid. And then um, the fifth one that gets sometimes mentioned um, is Ellis Burks. Oh yeah, another former Giant as well. But he yeah. also. Came after 93, though. So Yeah, he was all over. Um, And then the last question is, who is the sole representative of the Colorado Rockies in the Hall of Fame? Larry Walker. Bonus question, who is the next person in line to go into the Hall of Fame as Colorado Rocky if they ever get their shit together? Todd Helton. Okay. So you know your baseball. All right. You did way better than Johnny and Steven combined, so they can suck it and you win. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I love Steven, but you know what? He knows that I know my game. So, you know, that's yeah. I think that's why he brought me in, you know, and wanted to hook me up with you guys. So that way we could get a good little representation and show that we know a little bit about the game as well. So right. We're not just all just books and stuff out there. Do you have another yeah, question, Mike? Picking it up. You, did you get that question, Mike? Uh, yeah, Mike got back to me. He wants all to right. know um, final who's trivia. All time, who's the all time triples hitter in Rockies history? And I will give you a hint. Nobody. Even um, he most recently played with the Los Angeles Angels. Yeah, that was my guess. I would have got that one right. You know, this is only because this name just really resonates with me. It's probably not it, but I want to say Chris Iannetta. No. Nope. I don't know. I was I, talking I, in triples. Yeah. That's a that's a great guess because Ionetta did play in the AL West there for a while. Yeah, he, he was yeah. There. He's actually on the team now, but he's on the IL. Oh, he's okay. He's active. He's on, he's on the team now, but he's active, and he's a leader in triples for the Rockies. Yeah. But he plays on the Angels now. Oh, oh, and he um, he played for the Cardinals for a while. Play for the Cubs for a hot minute too. Yep. Oh, is that Dexter Fowler? There you go. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Nailed it. Dexter, yeah. Young Dex with the Rockies. That was uh, when Matt Holiday did, or did he not touch home plate? He touched it. We were there. <laughs> we were in the You know he watch. did. We all know we're, he touched it. Don't even have to ask, bro. He, he touched home plate, and Darren Ruff didn't swing. We're, we're all squared away. <laughs> <laughs> Sound like a salty Giants fan. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you, Julian, spending some time talking ball. Honestly, it was cool talking, uh, getting a little no ins and outs of all of Fresno Grizzlies. And I I am rooting for the Giants out of the NL West. I really am. I don't know about James as a Longoria fan, but uh, good luck to the Giants. Good luck to you. Good luck to the Grizz. And cook some sweet-ass food for that office, man. Appreciate you guys, man. Anytime you guys want to come out to Fresno, I'm sure Steven's already extended the invite, but anytime you guys want to come out, you know who to hit up for the tickets. Um, we'll take care of you, all right? I appreciate that. Yeah, man. let's talk soon. Yeah, we'll figure right it out. <laughs> Later, Jules. Right on. Thank you for tuning in. Find more content at BlakeStreetBanter.com.